Welcome back to Woman to Woman, Conversations in Black and White. I'm Bernadette. I'm Linda. We're sharing our conversation with you this beautiful, cloudy, rainy morning mm -hmm. to learn from each other, to open our hearts to each other, and to share it with you so that you might learn something too, and hopefully be encouraged to cross those difficult lines and uh, find partners and uh, small groups to talk safely with yourself about sensitive topics. Today's mm -hmm. topic. Today's topic, we are going to look at the intersection of race and politics, specifically on like state legislation and federal acts, because I think sometimes we miss those connections as to why some demographic lean towards larger government, meaning federal government, and other demographics, typically the dominant culture, lean towards smaller states' rights. And that original, what would you even call it, Linda? Like that original allegiance began way back and was the cause of the Civil War. Do you want to expand on that, Linda? Well, there's... Yeah, there, there's, there's a myth that is perpetuated that the Civil War was actually about states' rights and not about slavery. But when you look at the actual history and the real documents from the time of the Civil War, the key people, the vice president of the uh, Confederacy, uh, very specifically said this is to allow the states to pursue and maintain and perpetuate slavery because we need it economically and because black people are in inferior, in a variety of those things. You can look it up. The vice presidency, uh, I think he was called the vice president of the Confederacy, wrote all that down and it's there. Um, so they called it states' rights, but in essence, it was to perpetuate slavery. And the federal government then under Lincoln said, no, you can't do this, that we take priority over that. And I know you've watched more history about uh, the federal government at that time than I have mm -hmm. about Lincoln. But the fact is that the federal government prevailed and in many situations since then, the federal government has the ability to supersede states' rights in almost all cases. However, there's still a thousand different things that states can decide to do. And the mm -hmm. federal government has the ability to override it for the good of all people. And in a lot of ways, this is why, this is why we have highways, this, because we have a federal government. This is why we have social security. This is why we have banks the way that we have them. Um, what else? There's a thousand different things, Bernadette. Um, this is why we had the civil rights movement. This is why we had equal access to the ballot box. This is why Black people were right. able to buy homes wherever they wanted to buy homes. This is why we had access to educational things. There are so many oh, education, rights, yeah. Right, yeah, rights slash privileges that I, not only as a woman, but also as a Black person, would not have access to if without the intercession of the federal government. Right. We live in Missouri. Missouri was literally the last state, last state to abolish slavery. And that was not because they wanted to. So as a black person, I would probably be little more than a slave today if it were left up to the state. Mm -hmm. And as a woman, there are a whole slew of things I would not have access to if it were left up to the state. Right. And so I don't think sometimes people recognize what recognize the why some of the division politically is what it is. And that is because marginalized populations have only been able to get access to certain quality of life, our only venue has been through legislation on a federal level. Yes. It has never been on a state or local or city level. It literally never has. Right. And so that is why a good majority of people of color or marginalized populations tend to believe in larger government 
because that is the only way we have had access to some semblance of dignity and integrity and be able to pursue a quality of life that we would like to have for ourselves. It has only been through federal mandates. Right. Yep, I would I would completely agree with you, and I believe that I'm right in uh, the fact that even as a as a white woman with that level of privilege, my right to vote and to do a number of other things to hold jobs, to be have a military, credit card in your own name, right, mm -hmm. credit card in my own name, all of these things are a result of federal legislation, not state legislation, and if it was left up to the states, I still would not have a lot of those rights. And, you know, before we started this, I did not, I had a busy last few days and I did not do my history research. So I apologize for that and uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, I, I am technically a generation ahead of Bernadette here. And I um, was going to be a single parent in the 1990s. That's not that long ago. I was going to be a single parent. And my husband and I had owned a house together jointly for um, like uh, 10 years prior to that. And the bank that knew me personally, because I was in a small town, they knew me. They did not want to put the mortgage in my name because um, I was a woman and I wouldn't be able to pay it. And I had to, I had to work my way around that. And I did. I got it completely in my name. But... Um, it was, it was challenging. So that was as recent as the 1990s. And federal legislation is what has opened those doors where states would have just kept on with their own small-minded, no, we want white men to be in charge and nobody else. Mm -hmm. So federal legislation is the, is the, I don't even know what to say. It's, I mean, sure, you'd like to say, oh, less government, but less Federal legislation, as, as a lot of people understand it, is it's like it is the, the leveler to keep yeah. things from being so out of balance, to keep little pockets of either small majorities or small minorities, whatever, whatever it turns out to be, from, mm -hmm. from taking advantage of other classes. And on a local small level, that can very often happen. And it's only the protector of the rights. The federal government should be the protector of the rights to see that things are equal. And when you look at the public school system, that's where the public school system came from. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be executed justly as it should. I mean, look at the abysmal failure of, of reconstruction and you look at the continued abysmal failure of the public school systems and how those are funded. So it's not as if it is always done justly. Right. But it, but it would have never been done had federal government not interceded. Right, and exactly. you, and you And we can look at this week, look at how Texas has essentially eliminated abortion, whether you're pro-life, pro-choice, pro-whatever in Texas, as a state. And so we have, and, and if you look at the Supreme Court and how they've decided, well, we don't know if that's hurt people enough yet, let's wait and see. And so the federal government in some form or fashion is going to have to intercede because individual states, starting with Texas, are rolling, are making conscious attempts to roll back rights. And not only women's rights, we're looking at voting rights. And so, Unfortunately, as Linda said, the federal government's role has been throughout our country's history to somewhat be the equalizer and to not have the chips so stacked against right. certain demographics. Because if we leave it to the states. Right. And even there, like you say, enforcement can be erratic or non-existent. Yeah. So there's still, this doesn't guarantee that a person will be treated equally in a given state, but mm -hmm. at least there is some equity. Uh, there is some expectation of equity and justice. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if I'd done more historical research ahead, I could do better on this, but I, I do know the outlines of it, but feel free to add anything yeah. else.
I think it, it was some elected official somewhere, and I don't know who it was. It was a black gentleman, I think, from the South, and he was talking about the purpose of legislation. He said, you know, legislation affects or impedes policy, but it does not change hearts. And so it's unfortunately, in order for some people to be treated somewhat fairly and with some measure of equity, it does have to be stated legally and there have to be repercussions for you not doing so or people won't do so at all. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So you and I are in the business of education and changing hearts. Yes. And, uh, we're not up there doing the legislation themselves. We try to vote for good people that will be um, have the best interests of all at heart. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, there's there's work on all these different levels. Yes. So before so to and and Linda and my goal also is to try and lower the temperature. So before some oh yeah, yes. and you'll and you'll see it on Facebook or any other social media post. What we pose you to think of is before you respond or retort to something quickly because you didn't agree with it politically. Take a step back and look at that and evaluate or look at that person's gender or ethnicity or class in society and think, how would that affect my political view? Because I would imagine if I were a white man in society, which is like winning the lottery here in the United States, I probably would be a conservative Republican. I wouldn't have any reason not to be because I hadn't, I didn't have to wait for someone to grant me the privilege to do anything. But that has not been my existence in the United States of America. So I challenge you to, before you respond, take a look at the facets in that person's life, because that will give you some insight as to why they feel how they feel and why they are advocates of what they are advocates of. And that will allow you to make a connection in an entirely different way than it would if you just popped off at the mark. Mm -hmm. Good comment, good mm -hmm. comment, yeah. And although we are, we are participating by doing videos, we also are not particularly believers that hearts are changed on Facebook necessarily, so. <laughs> right? No. Right. It's no. probably the lowest level of transformation that happens, so. Um, yeah. Something Bernadette and I did in the past few weeks is we offered through uh, through my church, we offered a conversations in black and white with, um, we would take one of the videos and it was all through Zoom, mm -hmm. which allowed us to know we didn't meet in person, but we also had people from Detroit and uh, all kinds of other places that were mm -hmm. part of our group. Uh, Texas at one point. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but we had we would watch one of our videos conversations in black and white and then we would discuss it and creating a safe space so this is one of the tools for change is join a group where you can feel safe and uh, begin to talk about these things because there's so much to learn about someone else's experience when you open open your mind open your heart and actually begin to to learn what someone else's experience is like so. Yeah. so as we always say, and we say it with intention, we really do. We really want people to, for one, start talking, which right. can be uncomfortable. But as Linda and I have shared in a previous video, once you start talking, it becomes easier to keep talking. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. We get, so we, we get more comfortable with the discomfort. That's the best yes. way to say it, so. Yes, that is, that is the best way to say like it. Like working so, a muscle out, you know, it is. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. so. yes. And, you, and, you, and you learn to breathe in and breathe out and be able to take different perspectives and not take it personally. And that is a, that is a wonderful exercise for human beings to become better adept at doing. So we, we truly do encourage that. So go find somebody to start talking to and then keep talking to them. And Linda and I will see you real soon. <laughs> All right. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.